Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Daytime talk royalty. Tamron Hall. Well, who? <laughs> what? Where'd you get that? Who wrote that? I love my mom for sending that in. Thank you, mom. She listens to the Breakfast Club. Good morning, mama. Good morning, Ms. Hall. How are Hi, you? I'm wonderful. How about yourself? I am blessed, black, and highly favored. I love that. I am feeling the same way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good What's, to see you. Thank you. This is my first time in your studio. I know. It's we did like a, Zoom, a right? stimulation like overload. Zoom, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we did Zoom. So I'm I, I'm cleanest. one of those people because I, it's not the cleanliness. Very I see underwhelming, stories right? stories behind everything. That's right. Oh, yeah. DJ Envy, you and your wife are going to be on my show soon. Yep, yep, I yep. can't wait. Uh, we're excited. Super duper excited. I oh, love man. this. Uh, there's a lot of alcohol. <laughs> it's all for props. Yes, yeah. But you don't, what? Oh, 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 you do have the, um, Puffy sent me a monogram vodka, gin. I never opened it. Vodka? You guys have oh, one, Ciroc. too. Yeah, Ciroc, yeah, 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 yeah. I think you have one, yep. too. Yeah. So, yeah, if it has your name on it, you know, you kind of got to, I guess you're not supposed to drink those. I didn't drink it, I just left it there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's for prop, like you alls That's right. But it's cute. Now, how, was it for, how was it for you doing the show during a pandemic without an audience? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> it, I mean, it was terrible. I know, I, I had Seth Meyers on the show the other day, and he said... He enjoyed it because it allowed him to connect more with viewers in the way he didn't expect. I think the first half of it, I said, just thank God we're on air. Mm -hmm. Like, we're on air because we would be canceled otherwise. So we have a chance to stay on. And then when we went back in and had to go back out this last round when Amara Crown. Omicron. 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 I'm a journalist. And I, I'm Omar, I did. I did. You <laughs> call me out. Doing that. I know. And I'm a journalist. I should know better. <laughs> but that second wave in December, I had to go back into my home and do the show. And it was miserable. And I realized, and you all know this, and, and Charlamagne, especially with your shows, it, it is having an audience is, it's like the Ten Commandments is one of the That's rules right. of daytime. You have to have an audience. I, I My first time even attending a daytime talk show, I went to Temple University and I came to see Geraldo Rivera wow. in person <laughs> way wow. back when he had a talk show. Mm -hmm. And it just it's a part of the energy. So, yeah, it was rough. I did not like it. I wonder when you went to go see Geraldo back in the day, is that when the bug hit you? Did you Absolutely know? Absolutely not. No. No, not at all. <laughs> did you ever see his show? Yeah, yeah. Like people throwing chairs. No, yeah, yeah. no, no. I was a college student at Temple and they, you know, they would always recruit young audiences mm -hmm. to come mm -hmm. in. And we were here. Uh, two of my best friends are from Brooklyn. And they went to Temple, and so we just did what college kids do. You come mm -hmm. to New York, you hang out in Times Square, you got free tickets to go to a show, and it happened to be Geraldo Rivera's. Uh, so when did you get the bug? Yeah, that when did you it? see yourself um, doing When that? did I get the bug? When did I get the bug? Well, um, I would. I was born. If, I, if you ask me what I would be doing right now other than this, I jokingly say... Uh, blackjack dealer, but I don't even know how to play cards. I, I didn't that, have a. I don't even know how to play cards. I can't play spades, and I'm from the south. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> you can't play I don't know how to play spades. I am an. I don't know how to play dominoes. I'm an embarrassed. What about Uno? Can you at least Uno? play Uno? I don't Uno. play board games. You went to Uno is not a board game. What is it? A card game. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't play cards. I don't. I was never one of those people. I don't. I don't play Monopoly. I think I do. What did y'all do as fun in college though? Because that's the a lot thing. of good stuff. Like we played spades. We played cards. Not me. You didn't go. Wow. Class? I did not. Not a lot. No, I that, <laughs> I uh, what, was, what, what was going on at Temple? What were you doing? Oh, house music parties. We used to hang out at Penn a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The Penn parties, okay. the Mitten Hall parties. Uh, but no, I never played cards, so I don't uh, even know how we got on that one. But yes, I'd say blackjack <laughs> dealer. But no, I never had a backup plan. It, this was always uh, what I wanted to do. I think early on, Johnny Carson's show mm -hmm. was something that was in the background, but. I quickly realized I wasn't a white guy mm -hmm. and named Jimmy or James. And so that late night world throughout my entire career was really just a white guy until Arsenio. Arsenio yeah. And I think I think maybe seeing Arsenio, obviously Rolanda, obviously Oprah, Phil Donahue, but they all had Rolanda. different. Wow. Remember Rolanda yeah. Watts? <laughs> yeah. People forget yeah. how important she was in the marketplace. So it was there wasn't a moment. It was just I felt like I didn't have a choice. It was the I was. This is what I was going to do. And I didn't know it was going to be a talk show. I knew I was going to be a journalist. I love writing. I love reporting. The talk show thing happened, as you know, because I got fired. And mm -hmm. so I had to figure out how was I going to get back into TV and not feel as owned as I had previously. If you hadn't gotten uh, fired from the Today Show, mm -hmm. do you think you'd ever gotten into 
daytime talk? No, because in daytime talk, any shows, you know, that's just with y'all show. People, it's almost like the Rocky syndrome. Mm-hmm. People need to root for you. And yeah. in talk show world, they need to root for you. They need mm-hmm. to feel a connection with you. And so I, while I did have a great run, I feel, at the Today Show, and even before that in Chicago for 10 years, because I was recruited to come to the Today Show after being on air in Chicago. But uh, no, because you, you have to have an arc. Every, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's like a superhero. You need, mm-hmm. like, I had the ultimate nemesis in the person that they selected, mm-hmm. even though I'd never met her and, and never crossed paths with her. You have that juxtaposition. Clearly, I watch a lot of superhero things. But you have, <laughs> <laughs> so you have a juxtaposition of a villain. You have your story arc, your, your origin story. Mm-hmm. So what was my origin story? I got fired. And as a black woman, being 48 years old, and being fired, that hit a nerve with people. What is she going to do? How does she come back? And that gave me opportunities to get in rooms. But if I'm being honest with you, and I always will be, Harvey Weinstein got me in rooms that I was never going to be able to get in. Um, he was the most important person in Hollywood, and he decided he wanted to produce a talk show with me. Wow. Wow. And mm-hmm. so people started taking meetings to hear the pitch because of Harvey Weinstein and then midstream, Harvey was accused of rape and which I learned over a text message. Someone anonymously texted me and said, uh, there's an accusation of the R word. And I was like, R word, what does that mean? And then it all. So what happens there? Because he helped you with your career. But on the other no, end. No, he helped me get meetings. Helped I helped me meetings. with my career. Helped yeah. you get meetings. Yeah. But on the other end, he's, you know, accused of sexual it's assault. Terrifying. All, all through the place. So do you just step back and say, look, I'm, I'm a mom, my business, I don't know. And he's. Help put me in. in I didn't know what to think. It was like an emotional grenade. Mm -hmm. I'd never been in a room alone with him. So the first part was, thank God, right? Mm -hmm. Then the second part was, wait a minute, did the people who came with me in the room, did they know? And is that Mm -hmm. why they didn't leave me in the room? Mm -hmm. So there were these many, many questions. And then I'll be honest, um, came the moment where I, I was worried about my own survival. And then I felt guilty. Not, it wasn't that I didn't care. I would never say that, but there was a moment where you think, my career, oh my God, what happens mm-hmm. to me? Mm-hmm. I don't have a job now. I've been in the room with him. Now I'm tied and linked to him, and this show will never get off the ground because 99% of the people we were pitching to were white males of his level, if you will, mm-hmm. who were not necessarily open to an idea of a talk show with me. Especially and a black woman. Black woman, because yeah. there hadn't been one, right? Wendy had the longest running talk show outside of Oprah. There'd been here and there, but if you look at the long list of daytime talk shows, it's largely white men and women who these syndicators believe could appeal to, quote unquote, mainstream. Mm-hmm. And so even though the best who'd ever done it and the most successful in daytime was a black woman who That's actually right. didn't have children. She she knocked off all of the stereotypes of what's uh, what's relatable. So now I'm linked to him. I'm worried about my own survival. I am my backup plan. I'm thinking this I'm, I'm screwed. And then I had to take a step back and say to myself, what about these women mm-hmm. who are making these allegations? And I know just like with Bill Cosby, who spoke at my graduation, who I replaced on the board of trustees at Temple University. Even if you don't believe ha- all of them, if you have half and then half that half, you have at least one or two. Yeah, mm-hmm. you if know, there's at least one, one. person. And, and if there's what, one, that's one too yeah. many. And mm-hmm. that's how I looked at it. So I had to take a step back. And the minute that I started thinking about what it must be like for them, it's like the floodgates open. My, my confidence, I said, I'm going back in these rooms. I'm going to rewrite letters to all of these people and say, you let me in the room with him. Now let me in the room by myself That's right. and let me pitch myself. And so some of them uh, said yes. Some said no. As a spiritual woman, that had to like really psychologically, that's God working in a really mysterious way, right? It wasn't so mysterious. I yeah. actually felt like it was a clear sign that, you know, Lena Horne had a quote that was in this book, Stormy Weather. And I have a, gr- a great obsession with Lena Horne. She said something about white men getting you in rooms that you can't get yourself in. Mm -hmm. And that's how she felt at the time. And ultimately, that's not true. People will let you in the room. Um, I think you have to just keep beating down the door over and over. You we are all in this business that we know you walk in and you're instantly stereotyped. You're instantly uh, assumed to be something. Yes. And so I wrote back notes and I learned how also I, I used to tell people. 
I definitely channeled 50 Cent a couple of times in. <laughs> I became no longer afraid to brag on myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you have your own merit and you deserved it. But we shrink it down. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, we all do, but women, we especially the do time. in these meetings. And so then you defer to laughing at jokes that aren't funny or your presentation changes a lot. And so I said, I'm 30 years in this business. I'm going to run my resume down. And I, I, I really did channel every hip hop artist that you male <laughs> that you could imagine and I specifically zeroed in on men because they get a pass at saying some of the things that women can I went in very very hot <laughs> I was like yeah. this is who I am mm-hmm. and this is what I did and if I have to explain myself and I'm sure that was a turn off to some people but other people received it with the intention of if I don't stand up for myself who is and that's how I played it I always wonder about daytime television. Like, even though Oprah should be the bar, right? Yeah, she is. Black woman who defied every yeah. stereotype, yeah. weird name, some would say, yeah, she you know, it, yeah. looks everything. Yeah, yeah. Why didn't they continue to look for more of that instead of just going cookie cutter like they did? I don't understand it. It is something that I... Oh, goodness. It is they wanted daytime, I believe. Not they. Some people want it daytime to be white. Um, it's like Fort, I call it the Fort Greene syndrome. Mm-hmm. And it's that you have this neighborhood and for it to be of value, some people believe that it has to be white. Gotcha. And so as a result, even though the audience is largely all women of mm-hmm. all different backgrounds, our show is almost 50-50, 50% African-American, Latino, Asian, 50% white. So we have this beautiful diversity just straight down the middle of this show and though we have to happen to have one of the highest income earning daytime shows. So these are people, mostly women, who buy and who have huge purchasing power. But there will be people who say 50 percent African-American. That's not the audience we want. And, you know, they still mm, say that, you know, absolutely. that that is still the conversation. And I have it all the time. I've had people call in and say, oh, well, why is this? Uh, uh, why do they have so many urban guest this week mm-hmm. and uh, then you have other people who claim I don't mm-hmm. which is obviously not true but um, it's a fascinating thing and I think it still remains part of television I don't want to get into this whole thing but it, listen when I when I grew up watching TV it was almost more diverse than it is now you know Martin in Living Color oh, yeah. I mean the Living list if single, you go yeah. through some of the breakout the shows in mm-hmm. television the Fresh Prince and on and on Cosby, different uh, oh my god Damon Wayans show yeah. Bill D.L. Yeah. Hughley show yeah. I mean it, we go to Bill Cosby and Oprah but there was a, a we just had Guy Tory on mm-hmm. um, for their documentary about uh, Fat Tuesdays, Fat Tuesdays yeah. and they talked about this night that was created because TV executives would not go to Compton to hear comedians so they brought the comedians to Sunset Strip and almost every show you watch during the 90s and 2000s was because of a black comic performing on that night wow. and being seen by executives who would never have gone to Compton to hear them. So yeah. it's fascinating. But I think, wow. you know, I think it's a valuable landscape. That's why every year you see more shows launched mm-hmm. because there's money in daytime. But it's not always seen as a value when that money is coming from us, sadly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we saw Nick Cannon's show only six months, and then they canceled it rather quickly. And we were saying up here, we feel like he really didn't get a fair shake. He didn't get well, how, he what is a fair? Year. What's what? What do you define as a fair shake? I think six at least a year. Seems like not enough time to really a like year. make a mark and establish. It feels like you need a little mm-hmm. bit more time than six months. What do you think? No, I think that. He is brilliant, Mm -hmm. and he is one of the best interviewers I have ever sat in the room with. Mm -hmm. I think the show wasn't him. I don't know what the show was, but it wasn't him. And I think that's, I think they needed a reset, but it was too late. But I also think he got an incredible chance because he came in after a scandal that would have broken most people. I would not have gotten on TV had I said the comments about, whatever he said, mm-hmm. which he apologized for. Mm-hmm. And he deserved forgiveness for, and he deserved to be on air. I believe that was a big chance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A, not, a lot of people would mm-hmm. not have been able to get back on air. And I think that may have taken him off of who he is, right? Because you come in with such pressure. You've now just said this thing, you've apologized, but you know people are swirling and they're looking for you to fail. And so I didn't always see 
like the Nick that I love on that particular show. Could you be that on daytime, though? Because what you said, how they want you to cater to middle America, mainstream America. I think America. he could. He's okay. got Nick Cannon is one of the most successful people in entertainment, mm-hmm. bar none. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about all of the shows. So he has a huge fan base. I think coming in under that pressure mm-hmm. was never going to change, right? He was coming in with a cloud of people thinking, oh, man, he got a shot. Mm-hmm. Look what he said. Look what he did. And then I feel... You know, his personal life, which he was so honest and open about, was used against him. I mean, why he has, um, you know, kids or whatever it was, these storylines that became overshadowing of his talent. Mm -hmm. And he's so talented. No, that's true, because it's like you can't even really get into discussions about the show because you got to dig through all the other stuff. Exactly. And so all the articles became about his personal life, not about he had Jamie Foxx on. They had this amazing segment. I'm a TV junkie. I watch everybody's (laughs) show. I listen. So I never watched him as competition. I watch as a fan. Mm -hmm. But I feel like people didn't talk about the content. So I don't know how that was ever going to change. That's what I mean. So if you give them another year, another six months, were they going to be able to change what people were talking about, sadly, which was his personal life? And he owned it. He smiled about it, whatever. Well, I don't, I, I just, I, I thought, why aren't we talking about his interviews or his content? Mm-hmm. And so that's what I mean by it. I don't know if a year would have changed that. But if anybody's going to be back on TV with 60,000 well, shows, on TV, well, right. he yeah. still is. Mm-hmm. So he's got more shows and more millions than I'll ever have. Does, does Tamron Hall feel like a successful talk show host yet? Yeah. Okay. I do. I do. I do. But what about you, man? That's an interesting question. Why'd you ask me that? Um, just because it's like, you know, you, you you came in and then everybody was like, oh, we don't know if it's going to last, but then you got another season. Now you got renewed for two. Mm-hmm. So now you breathe a sigh of relief and like, oh, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> but if, if everything was the end now, you'd feel successful. If everything were to end now, how do I guess how do you define success? What is success? It's subjective. Right. Yeah. So I think for me, success is, yeah, I did something to your point that people didn't think could be done. Mm-hmm. And now we're about to go in our fourth and fifth season. I don't know. I listen, I was a success the day that I was born. My mother right. beat the odds. She was a nineteen year old single mom with no husband. My grandfather brought me home with a second grade education. He could not read. So I was a success when I, the day I came out of my mother's body because no one expected her to be able to be a great mom at a, as a teenager, this country girl who then moved to a bigger city. Uh, so I don't measure it by the talk show. I really don't. And I know that sounds all like, oh, I don't. I don't. I do not. I, I don't. Because you'll, you know, you'll define yourself by it. There's a right. book that I read called The Path of Light, and it says, are you what your card says beneath it? So right now, whoever's listening, you all take out your occupation. Are you still you? That's right. right. And I, I had to very early on in my life um, measure my life by that because none of the people who I raised even had a business card to have a title underneath it. Mm. So they didn't measure themselves. So I wasn't raised to measure myself by that. Mm-hmm. So And even doing things you're passionate about, like your new show on Court TV, yeah. Someone They Knew. Yeah. That has to feel good because that's something that you really wanted to do. On- yeah, right. Because now, so that going back to your question, you know, the success, the success is being able to choose your projects, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And choose the things you want to do. So now I, I do have that option. So Court TV came to me and they said, we want to do a show, Someone They Knew, and we would like for you to, to do it. I, I did a crime show called Deadline Crime for six seasons, including when I was pregnant with Moses. And I couldn't do it anymore because it was just I was an emotional wreck. And you talk a lot about mental health. Imagine reading a script about, you know, a mother being murdered and I'm pregnant and I hadn't told anybody. And I'm thinking, can my baby hear this way? Is he going to have anxiety? Like, what am I doing? And so I said, once I finished that last season, I would never do it again. Um, But I miss talking to people um, and giving them an opportunity to be comforted and giving them a chance to tell what happened to them. And this show is fascinating to me because the common denominator is someone they knew. I mean, the crime show I did before was random crimes Mm -hmm. across the country, which are all compelling. But this is right now someone in this room could snap. Mm -hmm. And these aren't like people who, oh, who are you looking at? I'm not looking at, (laughs) wait wait a minute. It's the guy back there with the cap on. No, but we talk (laughs) about crime, especially in New York, of randomness, you know, somebody jumping out of an alley or someone Mm -hmm. following you home or a fender bender and two people get into it. But these are people that were brought into the lives of the victim through no fault of the victim. And it tells you a lot about greed, envy, jealousy, Mm -hmm. passion, Mm -hmm. displaced passion and what can happen. So the common thread is, and I always tell people, this show is not meant to scare you, but it is to say 
that there is someone in your sphere, in your universe, who could turn into a different person, Mm -hmm. who could go from the friend to a murderer. And that's what these stories are about. It's it's amazing. And we see it all the time on the news. Absolutely. You know, like oh, yeah. the guy who uh, works in the building where you live and he's a superintendent. No, no. These are people husband. in in their yeah. world. Like for women, one in four women um, are the victims of a domestic violence crime or assault. Mm-hmm. That person is in their life. Yeah. So this it's not the guy who's, you know, the door guy or the guy who parked the car who suddenly gets fascinated. These are like intimate individuals in the lives of these people and you wonder what drives someone you know remember that movie sleeping with the enemy yeah, I was mm-hmm. right that's that, the thing right, right. The you're lying in bed with someone and you believe that they love you and with the same mouth and voice that they say i love you they can say i hate you right and that's what's so mm-hmm. fascinating so this show um really is it's it's a head trip because you do wonder how did that person go from being we use that phrase "ride or die." They go from being your ride or die to wanting you to die. Yeah, Are you and it's crazy. Shows? Did you I, watch them? See, because I watch them like on the weekends. The shows are on. Me and mm-hmm. the wife cleaning or whatever we're doing. And this, you always want. It's just so interesting. They are, and I can't watch them at night. I, I watch it all. It's like watching a horror movie. So I do it all before. Like my son wakes up at five thirty a.m. and I will turn on the TV. And my husband's like, "Turn the TV on." Like, oh, yeah, I'm gonna watch this, and I will binge it like six a.m., seven so a.m. They're so interesting from a human nature perspective. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're all by what we do. Um, we're kind of the kind of like an archaeologist. We're studying human behavior. So, like for example, when I walked in this room. I could see you studying me and I was studying you. Mm-hmm. I start to look at body language. I hugged Angela, but I didn't hug you. I get you. Know, you, you, and then you watch how people respond. Was it my to... breath? Let me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're watching how people respond. Mm-hmm. I can even tell when my answer went too long because I can see it in your eyes, Charlemagne. So That's you can not see. True. I, love a I long can answer. see that it. No, nope. <laughs> you got it. You, your body shifted. <laughs> so I, you know, and you, and we all are like little investigators, right? Mm-hmm. And so these shows turn you into investigators because you're wondering, a. How do I avoid being a victim? B, could I sure. prosecute this? C, how would I investigate it? Which is also why I wrote my crime book. I have um, a crime series, Jordan Manning, um, as the Wicked Watch. I'm actually 15 chapters into the follow-up to that. And that book, like this show, all inspired by human nature. Mm-hmm. And I'm no professional at this. I'm a journalist who does a talk show. But I am deeply um fascinated by how people can take someone else's life no, especially same. someone they love especially you know when you talk about human behavior the only reason all of us are safe every day is because of human behavior mm-hmm. because we make a choice yes. not to go crazy on somebody <laughs> yes I mean, could you be pushed to it right yeah. could you be pushed to a point of no return i think i could you could 100%. I think, i've never felt like i wanted to you know they somebody told me one time that and I totally disagree with this, but I've had a woman say on my podcast that if a man doesn't ever feel like he wants to kill you, he doesn't love you. Well, that's a lie. Um, yes. No, that's and that, I was that, like, no, that is no, that's, absolutely that's not true. true. What I mean by that is not passion love. When I had my son, they talk about the mama bear thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that was real until I had my son. I could have. We were walking one day, and we live in the city, <laughs> and this man was just demonstrative and walking. Da, 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 da. And my baby was just learning to walk, and he nearly knocked him over. Ooh. I I saw stars. I saw, I mean, it was one of those moments like Oprah's. We brought Oprah in color. Power. I was like, hold my baby. I was like, <laughs> I was ready to kill this man. And I had, I turned. And before I, I'm like cursing, and my husband is like, what is this? And it was a rage mm. from the bottom of my feet. I can't believe I'm admitting this. To the top of my head. <laughs> Wow. I could have. I could see that. I could, it, When's the last time you wanted to kill somebody, Miss Hall? Never. Was that it was just at one time. Don't try. See, this is what you do. <laughs> Don't you try to make me mad like Kamala Harris. I will not fall for this nonsense. <laughs> not going to. You already got to have Nick Cannon mad at me. Be like, Tamara Hall said he didn't even. That is not what I said. So let me clear that up. I said that too many people were distracted by things that didn't matter, which were Nick's great interviews, Angela. So don't try to screw me with him. So, no. I, um... No, honestly, it was only when I had my baby that it was this mama bear. When mm-hmm. they tell you don't get in the middle of a bear cub and the mama bear, I understood and understand that snap because mm-hmm. I'd never felt it. It doesn't go away. Okay. And it, do- it doesn't. Oh, please don't it tell me that. It doesn't go away. I got six. You know, it doesn't go away. You feel like you're on guard constantly. I'm ready to do it. Really? 
I'm ready to kill somebody over my kids. Yeah, yeah, I'm not that, lying cause you, I, cause, yeah, I because we see, been, because yeah, we see so right. many stories yeah. all the time of people doing things to kids. I'm like, and you know, we are the wishing wish nigga would type of people. I'm wish Absolutely. a mother. I wish and that's, would. Okay, you said it. I won't say it, but that's how I feel <laughs> with my son. I feel like. What about I, your husband? Do you feel like that? No, about he's grown. Now? He's 53. But if somebody did something to him, you wouldn't be like, I'm going to kill that person. Oh, no, we would get would. it going. No, okay. it's my husband. He feels like that about It's different. He better, I hope. Of course, of course. I This is a funny story. I was once engaged um, to a man uh, and we went on vacation together and we parasailed and we were out in the ocean in Cozumel or somewhere. This was many years ago. And the parasail snapped. I can't swim. I flew into the ocean. He was still on the boat. I called off the wedding. Absolutely. <laughs> I called, and that's a true story. No, as we the guy on the boat who didn't even speak English was like Psh, swimming toward me. He on the boat chilling. He didn't move. He was like, you had and a life vest. You had a life vest. Though. He was a lifeguard growing up. So I may, not, I may have told too much and he's going to sue me now. The difference between pools and go. oceans, though. What? I'm just trying to look at all that's sides. That's his fiance. I'm just, I'm just trying to be objective. Just, that fiance. should be your reaction. Should be, be I got to save her. And he's a lifeguard. You, last week, in, I think it was Miami, fiance fell in the ocean. Uh, guy jumped in after her. Choppers of the plane, uh, the boat oh, killed him. Oh, yeah, that him. was very sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going in for my wife. No, don't do I'm that. I'm just saying. Why don't you tell me that but that's what happened. I'm just saying. Like, that's so, not. No. no but and, and, and all they did was throw the life uh, raft for her and got her. But so. he died for love. Yeah, but he should have let the people on the boat do their job. No, I could not. I so could so not. what was his excuse afterward? What did, yeah. I didn't okay. speak to him. We flew all the way back and I said, Whoa. this is not going to work. And Damn. what was his explanation? I t- Listen. I did not they ask. They got you. I, I did not. I didn't. Out. I was so upset and so disappointed. Maybe he froze. You know, on Black Panther when she was like, "Don't freeze." Maybe he froze. Well, we'll never know. Because we'll I know. married somebody else. <laughs> we'll never so know. You wasn't that worried. You wasn't concerned yeah. about drowning. You was more concerned how come this nigga didn't come here. No, well, not that word. <laughs> but I, well, that mo- no, what I no. So first of all, the parasail. I was terrified it was going to come down over my head. But it fell behind me. I had a life jacket on. I can't swim. So now I'm thinking two things. Thank God the parasol did not. Then I'm like, Jaws is going to eat my legs because right. I'm in the deepest part of the ocean. He might have my- been thinking that, too. He was like, uh. <laughs> So whose side are you on, Angela? <laughs> Far away from the boat. First room. you were like, I can't believe it. And jump there. you're like, what, wait a minute. What if there's Jaws? <laughs> um, no, my legs are dangling. And th- how far is the boat? They had to turn around. Wow. Oh, so you for a minute. Because I flew. It snapped. And I flew out. And... Pow, hit the water. It's like cement. I could have died. And then they flew back around, came back, and then I realized I wasn't going to go under, and I locked eyes with him. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wait a minute. Swim this way. <laughs> right? Swim this way. Right. <laughs> Doggy pedal. Keep oh, so Keep he didn't even up. try to explain himself? <laughs> you know, it's so long ago, but I, yeah. I, whatever he said wasn't suffice. Oh, it, wasn't, it wasn't enough because I remember getting on that boat, and I was like, this man will oh never, <laughs> ever. What if he was like, now? world star? <laughs> yes. I'm trying. Yeah, you've been taking lessons, right? I've been <laughs> trying. I still can't swim. So, and you I can't? No. Oh, you should come man. and, th- well, my son can swim. I'm still learning. Isn't that terrible? Your son can swim, and you're like, uh, well, you, you guys great. love building people up. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> you're, right what can I do? That's how I feel when little kids be swimming circles yeah. around me, and I'm like, why can I still He's not He's a part him? of my motivation, going back to that mama bear. So when when we got our our, 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 got our kid when I had him and um, he's I said okay we have this pool and you know we do so many stories and it is so important mm-hmm. and I did a report on you know there's this whole study on why people of color don't swim and it has nothing to do with an inability to swim um, it was a fascinating study from USA Swim that basically said two things um, when they asked young black girls it was about our hair Yeah, mm-hmm. um, it was about our hair but more important than that because that was a very small percentage you don't want to put your child in a situation where you can't save them. That's so, right. so many black parents and parents of color can't swim. And so you say, I know you can swim, but I need to be able to save my Thank baby. That's right. Right. And so as a result, it has nothing to do with like, like a lack of swimming programs. You know, a lot of people pointed to pools closing in areas. It had nothing to do with that. It was, I cannot bring myself to put my baby in a position where they would be harmed. And I can't, going back to mama bear, daddy bear, can't go in and save them. So that's been a part of it. So when I had Moses, I was like, I cannot possibly be here and not be able to launch in. So the first class I took, they taught me diving. So they would put these things and they the said. The first class was diving? 100%. They learned how to get in the water. Well, no, diving and retrieving. Mm-hmm. Because they said, 
we won't call it anything. We'll say a piece of something falls on, and we so we would never use that, you know, that visual. That but seems and like so a they were five or something, right? I there. needed it though, okay. right? So they would put it in, and I dive, and they taught me how, like, you know, your instinct is when you would dive in, you'd hold your breath. So you're panicking, and something is underwater. You go, and you dive in. Well, you're gonna run out of air. So they taught me how to push the air out going in, so that I could go in, and and so it was intense, and it was terrifying. But going back to what you will do for love. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things. I, I respect you breaking that off, though, because it's like you can't really do those vows, sickness and in health and all that you other stuff. You respect me now because you first were defending him and you said he could have been killed by well, a no, random a manatee. A manatee could have slapped him. Well, but why. I get it, though, because you can't you can't with confidence say those vows knowing that you almost let your woman drown. Or I couldn't be confident in hearing yeah, it. What hearing about my yeah, perspective? Yeah, he could probably have said them because I'm sure now I got to go find him on Facebook and I'll ask him, yeah. why gracious. didn't he jump in? But have you ever been at a crossroads? I met your wife, too. I met mm-hmm. um, Charlemagne's beautiful wife at the Tyler Perry studio. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any, have you been in a moment or a crossroad where you had to say, I, I got to jump in? Was there ever a, a confrontation with nah, a guy where somebody God, was no. looking at her? Already? Nah, no, not yet. Hopefully, never. I'm too old now to be doing it. Yeah, you got to get some push-ups. You're ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be ready. I was gonna ask, how old is Moses? Moses will be three in April. Three in April. When, you, when you're teaching, one thing about swimming, just remember, sometimes it doesn't matter that he can swim, but if kids are around him and grab him, even though if you could swim, right? so they teach you, if that's the case, tell Moses to go down under the water. Because when you go okay, under the water, my heart is racing now. Go. You got my heart racing. I, 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 you're, I know. That's and that's what I, I teach the kids swimming. And the reason I didn't never learn how to swim is in Queens, we didn't have swimming pools. Do you swim now? I swim. Yeah, okay. I was on the swim team. I'm oh, you were? Guard, all that. Yeah. So I taught that. Even with the Beijing in your bed, you still jump in the water? Shut up. But is that I, that? I, that's not Beijing. Oh, okay. Not Beijing. <laughs> it's but just I, for men. But it's as soon as the kids are yeah. young, like Six, seven months, I put them in the water. That's what we did. Them. So that way they learn, and all my kids know how to swim great. See, that's good. We did that with Moses. We started at, uh, he was a few weeks old. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, I saw a Gabrielle Union is a friend, and I saw Kavya in the water, and I was like, okay, look at her. She's doing it. I'm showing my infant these pictures. Like, And I, she is a phenomenal swimmer, and I wanted him in the water. But it is truly one of those intimidating mm-hmm. things, even still for me. But it is so important, and there are so many misnomers about why Black people don't swim, and it just, when I got involved with this organization, USA Swim, and started studying, it was after, I think it was three, and I don't want to quote it wrong, but there was an incident in Louisiana where there was a sandbar, and the children fell in, Mm. and they drowned, and as adults were going out to save them, they were drowning. It's like three generations of a Mm. black family died. This was about 10 years ago I did the story. It was devastating, and nobody in the family, and so the others were forced to stand at the shore. And it was just wow. like, it blew That's my terrible. mind. It blew my mind. And it was, that was also a part of the catalyst for me wanting to help them get the message out about the swim. But you can come over. We'll help you. I know. I got to learn how to swim. You this do. How old are you? Uh, too old to not know how to swim. Oh, you don't say your age? I should have asked. She's never been to Disney World. Well, never saw The Lion King either. I saw the play. The Broadway play, The Lion King. What? <laughs> okay, you judge me for not playing Uno? <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? She got a point, you. Uh, I have seen the Broadway play, though. I know the gist That's of not the that line. movie. That's right. You've never seen the movie? And I've not never even been the to one Disney World. Disney World. You Disneyland? I've been to Disneyland in California, never Disney World in Orlando. Why don't you guys take her for her birthday? I'm no, not, I'm no thank you. I got enough kids. <laughs> I'd rather yeah, have, have a good like, time. Like, I have four daughters. <laughs> I, I will go with enough. you. Yeah, you will we'll love go swimming it. in Disney World. No, <laughs> we will not. No, we will not do that because there are a lot of kids in that water and everything <laughs> else there. It is, you know what? It's very, very fun. It is truly magical. Mm-hmm. And you have to get that iconic picture where you're right in the middle mm-hmm. and it's behind. Do you have any nieces or nephews or anything? I have a lot of younger cousins. You got. You should do a family trip. It's expensive. I think I will go with my friends at this point now and my kids. I have three godchildren. You know, they're You should to... go. I know you give great financial advice just it is expensive i, I was start it is the, she gotta get the tour you gotta get the tour my girl koya you gotta get the radio fast in pass. orlando she's um already set it up so when i go yeah. there next she's like we're gonna go it's 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 a lot you want to get a fast pass you want to get a tour yep. you want no. it and then it's gonna it's a lot what gotta go next month I, am i too old I to be in disney world without a child year. though no listen do you know that disney is the number one destination for couples to honeymoon 
Mm-hmm. I could never honeymoon. That's too much stress. Why would they <laughs> that's, that's too, that's too tired. And they have the whole Disney wedding collection. Nah. Like people, you know, like they had the Gucci Disney collaboration. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They have people go and they, they design beautiful uh, gowns inspired by really? the princesses. Yes, princess. Is that a word? Too much. Yeah, my oldest daughter does cheerleading, so they have their cheerleading competition there every April. No, it is it is it yeah. is truly I'm gonna magical. make it there. I'll let you know. You're gonna make it there. You're like you're gonna <laughs> Mars with Pete <laughs> David. <laughs> I'm gonna make it there. I'm gonna let Jeff Bezos, Bezos know. <laughs> give me a seat. I'm gonna you could go tomorrow. You own like half of Brooklyn. I read every no. time about you buying another house, another town. You should get on the plane Sheesh. tonight and f- fly tonight. private right, I'm gonna see and fly later. right back. No. <laughs> you should just fly right there and now, go. You know what fascinated me? You had some of the a couple of the women from Tinder Swindler mm. on the That's show. That's terrifying. Yes, that was terrifying to me. But I feel like people didn't have a lot of sympathy for them. They didn't. People don't have sympathy for... We do a lot of shows on... Um, this type of crime, this type of fraud that takes place. And we did one season, I think it was season one or two of our show, a woman, she was a CIA spy, and a man swindled her out of over a million dollars. And people had no sympathy for her. And I don't, it breaks my heart. And I and I try to explain to folks, cons are good because they're cons. Right. And, and when people say, oh, that wouldn't have ever happened to me. Like, yes, that's what they do. It's like, it, that's their. They spend their entire day trying to figure out how to get you to give. You don't think you could do it? I'll be watching the yes, show. Like, I think last would. night I watched Raw Food and Wine. I think it's that's the name. Of you've it. never oh, yeah. felt raw. taken it. Oh, that was Raw Vegan. I oh, saw boy, that yeah, one. Yeah. Raw you've raw never vegan. felt taken advantage of ever. In a, no. in a romantic yeah, situation. Swindled. Remember you bought them I, I fake leather jackets? Jacket. I bought a fake leather jacket, but that was $200. You bought a fake... It was on the train. But that's this the beginning. First, no, it wasn't even on the train. <laughs> I seen him. But he put the fire against the leather and told me leather doesn't burn. But you... This, look, look, yeah, you <laughs> okay, look, you understand how crazy that sounds? But, I bought a <laughs> leather jacket with a guy with a flame torch gave me <laughs> a test. It was a that, great story. It is a great story. It was. But that's what that's how it starts. But it's only two hundred dollars, two fifty. It doesn't to matter. You. That's a lot of that's money. A lot of money to, that's a lot of money to a lot of people. And I feel like people. you bought several. I was jackets. Get my whole life savings but two fifty is the beginning. So if he first of all, two fifty is a lot of money again to buy a jacket on a subway. With a flame torch. With a flame torch. Mm-hmm. Fifty dollars, I could see. Two fifty is a lot. So you like you bought some fake sneakers too. Look what you just said. He said. Right. It was real, that, and that's what you got. Got. If and you can wear a fake beard, you, you can wear a fake leather. Shut up! No, it's your beard. Not fake. Do you? Do you? Do you dye it? No, I don't do nothing to it. It's He's lying. lying. You I told us you did. Just for, just now you got to stop. Like, it's, you know, it's, don't try to swindle us. Are you a pitch person for them? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. He's not. Well, you a mentioned person. it three times. I'm like any name I mentioned three times. You get what? Do you have a? No, no. People always ask about your skin. Everyone always talks how beautiful it is. I have a dermatologist, Dr. Natasha Sandy, but. It's beautiful. But Tammy. I don't use Beijing. Tammy, have you ever been swindled? Yes, ma'am. Have I ever been swindled? Like, yeah, like a date anything? swindle? Or no. any, like, how, have you talking about the flame torch <laughs> no, with the leather? No, like, no. Uh, have I? Yes. But you yes. bought fake? I've never bought anything fake. But you get? How do you no. get swindled? Oh, I can't tell the story. <laughs> Come on. It was a notebook. <laughs> no, because it involves illegal stuff. No, because I... <laughs> I know. <laughs> how much did you lose? Just say that much. I didn't lose anything. I got it back, but... How much did they take before you got it back? Uh, they, they, I had deposited... Five thousand dollars. Wow! And and then uh, because of our service related to my child, mm. and then the service turned out not to be legitimate, and then I had to go and get it back. Get it back. And we could have bought twenty leather jackets. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I did. Jackets. I'm like, I, I hate being cagey, but it did get legal, so I can't get okay. you. Should be watching. Like, you really? I now I want my money back. Um, but it, you know, with the dating thing, it, it's about getting someone when they're vulnerable and love makes us so vulnerable mm-hmm. going back. I mean, I don't want to make this a thematic show, the love of your child, the lack of love with the guy didn't jump in to save me. Any of these things, it's, it's love and, and they zero in on it. I had the tender swindler women on and to your point, you think like at the point they're asking for, Oh, my check didn't come in. If you front me this, I'll give it back. They just nibble away. At the same time, they're love bombing them. Right. They're showering them with gifts. And in that case, he was buying gifts with the money from other women. So you're thinking, oh, he just took me on a $4,000, you know, mm. dinner. So it's adding up. So he's got to have the check. money. I'm yeah. on a private jet. He'll give it back. 
But yeah, it is a huge problem. And think about it. These are the people who come on TV. Do you know how many others that you know who stay silent and who don't tell how Mm -hmm. they've been taken advantage of? It's crazy. But I I see how it can. Thank God it's never happened. But I see how it can. Yeah, watching that, I saw how it could happen because he was definitely doing a lot of things. He's pulling up in a Lamborghini. You don't think he has stolen it. And then he's taking them on trips on private planes. And then you're believing that his life is in danger because people are after him. Well, that's when he lost me. Security got beat up. When I heard that, that too much. We always remember when they start adding on, like, so that the, uh, the, they say they're the tells with a lie. (laughs) And so, obviously, you watch the eyes. If the eyes go down and go up, there are different tells. Mm-hmm. When people start adding on too much detail, right? That's when keep you know. Keep your life simple. They keep keep your life simple. If you ever, <laughs> I hate to give you this advice, but keep when, simple, when doing a crime <laughs> show, and I do, I view a lot of interrogation video mm-hmm. and looking, even with my new show. <laughs> at, you know, we have a one guy. We have his interrogation video, and I was sitting there the whole time, like, please stop. He just kept going, and he, you know, they say talk yourself into a lie. Mm-hmm. He just. Keep your lie. First of all, always commit the crime by yourself. Never, because if you're going to do it with anybody, they're going to tell. Every Are you crime. Crime How about not commit the crime? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what else should we do when we commit the crime? Angela, don't do it at Disney. No. <laughs> <laughs> there are cameras everywhere. No, I do a crime show. So, again, going back to what Charlamagne said, you study people. Right. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I always tell people, everybody, you, you get caught when you do it with somebody else. If right. you're going to rob the bank, just leave the car out front. And don't take anyone because they're going to tell on you. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is keep it simple. Stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. Do not go in the interrogation room believing that you can trick them. Mm -hmm. You cannot trick those investigators. That's all they do all day long Mm -hmm. is hear people lie. It's just like I know you know when people are lying in an interview. I do. Mm -hmm. I interview people and I'm like, this is not a true story or this is a TV version Mm -hmm. of the story. They know. Right. I, I want to ask you something because you you used this word a couple of times throughout the interview. Journalism. Mm-hmm. Do you think there are still such things as objective journalism, or is everything? It was never based? objective. It was never objective. Hundred mm. percent. It can, how can it be? Mm. It, we're humans. Mm-hmm. We go home to our lives. We go home. So you're telling me it's like when you know going back to my show, um, when they say to the jury, strike what you just heard. How? Do you how? Right. <laughs> it's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So we go in with our biases, we go in with our beliefs, we go in with our perspective, and how you extract that would make you one of the most incredible people ever, and that would be Jesus. Mm-hmm. Because I don't think it's possible. And now you can try to suppress some of it, but going back to, you know, the book that I wrote and when we talked about missing black and brown, people pick white blonde women to lead mm-hmm. for a reason mm-hmm. that's not that's a bias mm-hmm. because you believe that the audience values that life more mm-hmm. or will not turn it from that story mm-hmm. that's the reason why people i was on a couple of shows and people well, why do you think this continues to happen we know the answer why so then why does that happen because people have biases they see that looks like my daughter mm-hmm. that could be my kid mm-hmm. she looks just like my daughter's friend Oh, my gosh, that could happen in my neighborhood. Reporters are just people. It's impossible. And I know a lot of my colleagues will greatly disagree with me and may not be happy um, with me saying that. I've been in newsrooms for 30 years. I'm in the newsroom with people, Mm. not robots. And you hear and see every day. And that doesn't mean it's a negative, right? Because sometimes your perspective and bias can help. But there is no way. There's no. Way. So how do you trust any of these networks, CNN, MSNBC, Fox? Because it's all opinion based. How do I know that they're just giving me the facts as they they know them? You don't. I mean, wow. you're asking me a beginning of time question. Mm-hmm. This is, I mean, journalism didn't start with MSNBC. I know people believe that, but it mm-hmm. did not. I mean, the history of journalism, muckraking. Um, you know, look at when we talk about dirty politics. I won't bore you, but take a second and look at the Thomas Jefferson attacks. I mean, just it, it is. It's incredible. So I feel like, uh, to over, not to oversimplify, but just even the, Alexander Hamilton. Everyone loves Hamilton. Why bring that up? That was some dirty politics. That's right. I mean, this isn't new. Journalism being used to um, demean. Look at some of the, I, people love cartoons, you know, political cartoons. You've seen some of the political cartoons of Irish people, Italian people, black people. We talk a lot about how we were made to look in political cartoons, these exaggerated you know, monstrous ways. 
this is a part of the political agenda since people could pick up a pen and a paper Mm -hmm. without words. So the idea that CNN, MSNBC or Fox started this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And the idea that human beings who come in from very different worlds and sometimes the people they're reporting on. I just saw a whole conversation about monetizing journalism. We know people, you and I, Mm -hmm. in journalism who make $60 million. Yeah. What are you going to do to keep that $60 million check? You're not, you're going to do what you need to do. Yeah. You're going to go on TV and say some crazy things yeah. if that's what you're paying to say. Anything that's monetized is corruptible. Right. Anything that's monetized is tainted. Mm. And when you make millions of millions of dollars as a journalist, which I hope to, it's going to impact you. It is. And so, that's a lie. And when people say that it doesn't, you make $8 million a year. What are you going to do to keep making that $8 million? First of all, why? Why? And I, I, I say that knowing again that I want all of us to have eight to 20 to 30 million dollar contracts. But why? Um, if you're not a war correspondent, right, because those people are putting it in mm-hmm. on the line. Yeah. What you see out of Ukraine is incredible reporting that I don't and I could not ever do. But I do think that um, that's not, though, to say that there aren't honest journalists. I think most journalists are honest. Honest and bias are two different things. So what is a journalist? Because I feel like all of them are biased. Oh, what is a journalist? It's somebody who reports what they see Mm -hmm. and what they hear. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, what is opinion? That's different. Mm -hmm. But a journalist, I just did an interview with um, Chike and Kuti. They did the documentary on on Kanye. uh, Kanye. It's phenomenal. Uh, It's a phenomenal documentary. They are journalists to me. They picked up a camera and they journaled and chronicled the rise of Kanye West Mm -hmm. into what he is now, which I believe is a genius. So they follow that. That's journalism to me. Anybody can pick up their phone. And the citizen reporters, Mm -hmm. half of the crimes against black people related to police are because one person, George Floyd, she picked up the camera. You know what I mean? That she's a journalist. She's also brave and 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 a transformational person in this conversation of police brutality. But at the end of the day, she was a journalist. She picked up that phone Mm -hmm. and chronicled what she saw in an unbiased way but then turned it over from the perspective of being black Mm -hmm. and knowing that that could have been her too. Mm -hmm. So I think anyone can be a journalist. Opinion is very different. And that's, you know, after 7 p.m. or whatever. Yeah, I feel like everything is is, is opinion-based now. No, I don't think that's true. I don't think... There's a clear difference, I feel, between what happens from 9 until 5 or whatever, and then after 5, I think. Mm-hmm. I think I think so. But I that's think part that, of why representation matters so much, because we do have our own biases that we bring with us, like you said, yeah. but you want people that also have a similar experience because the way they tell the story is different well, I think than someone is from the outside that maybe doesn't understand cultural things. I, well, I think it's a complicated answer because I just had somebody on uh, recently who said, you know, well, as a white guy... I was in over my skis to talk about George Floyd. And I said, wait, but you can't view it that way either because I don't need to walk in your shoes to tell you that it's wrong. So, for example, I'm a kid from, you know, Texas, rural Texas. The only Jewish person I knew growing up was Jesus, right? When I first learned about the Holocaust, I think it was in the fifth grade, my teacher didn't have to tell me that was wrong. My teacher didn't have to say, oh, my God, I didn't need to be Jewish practice the faith, practice the culture, mm-hmm. uh, go to a Seder dinner, any of that. I knew what I saw on there was wrong. So I don't personally need to walk a white colleague through why George Floyd was wrong. And you can't let people off the hook by saying, oh. Well, no, I think you still have a responsibility to report and know when something's wrong. But yeah. I also feel like somebody that can relate to something more when I watch that type of reporting yes. is something 100%, that right. is important to have. Absolutely. Like if you have somebody who's from, say they're talking about our mayor, Eric Adams, and yeah. you have somebody that's from here that as opposed to somebody that's from Texas. Texas. Yeah. Yeah. I report. agree. It, it is a little bit it of a It is absolutely different. I think, though, what, what, what happens, though, is people then use it as an excuse not to know. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So <clears throat> I'm a reporter from Texas. It was my job to Mm -hmm. learn New York. It was my job to learn Flatbush or Crown Heights. It was my job. So I can't go into my newsroom and say, oh, I'm from Texas, so I'm bowing out. And when it comes to race and gender, I watch a lot of people bow out and use that as an excuse. Well, I'm not a woman, so I'll never know. Well, you know a woman. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not black, so I'm in over my skis. So I really am going to... 
I can't talk about that because I don't know. You're a human. You're a human. Mm -hmm. You're a human. And so I just, I am always careful of when people talk about, you know, that because they use it as an excuse for them not to know. Our diversity is important in the room for exactly what you said. It sometimes is used against us in the sense that it lets people off the hook for them not to learn. That's why I love seeing the conversations where they have panels and different people from yeah. different perspectives can talk about the same well, thing. Well, that's why and this show mm-hmm. works. I mean, that's why you're a hugely successful show because you come in, you bring your perspective, DJ NB, you guys bring your perspective and that's why a show like this, um, and I'm not just saying it because I'm here as a guest, this is what, one day people might not agree with something you say, they like what he says, and it's back and forth. That's why The View right. was such a hugely popular show, that, and that's why everyone tried to do panel shows. The key, though, is you have to have the right components, mm-hmm. and you have the ability and agency to speak up just as much as they do, which makes the show compelling. You're not just the woman there representing us. You're a strong voice representing us. Well, we see you salute Wendy on. Williams yes. uh, last week. Mm-hmm. Why was it important for you to do that? Wendy has done something. There are... There's a morgue of dead daytime careers, you know, where God, people. Damn, you, yeah, yeah, I can tell you listen to rappers. <laughs> <laughs> <What's> the, damn, <laughs> you, you in the morgue of dead daytime careers. <laughs> Meaning, <Jesus>. people. <laughs> that was like court TV slash rappers damn. slash. Cameron? I'm leaving. This has been too. I'm taking Drake <laughs> out of my bag. Where's Birdman? I'm out of it. I'm gonna take this crap. <laughs> no, what I said was, um, no, because I, I really, it's not the kind of show I would have done. I'm going to be very honest. But she did it so brilliantly mm-hmm. and did it for over a decade. And when people would say, oh, I, she was this, she was that, and nobody should be feeling sorry for her. Um, Howard Stern, no, A-list celebrities still go on his show despite things that he said, and he's the king of media. And I would hear people say, I don't want to go on Wendy. But they would go on his show. Mm-hmm. And I thought, this is a double standard. She is doing this shocking style of performance, which is exactly what he did. Mm-hmm. But she was somehow penalized in the eyes of some people. Mm-hmm. But she stayed on for 13 years. Yeah. She survived... Google how many failed daytime shows happen Mm -hmm. while she was on doing more with less. Mm -hmm. It was a chair and a woman who was an excellent performer in that style of television. And she deserves that that acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm getting all hot now. You make me bad. (laughs) Because I just feel like people, like I said, listen, there are a lot of things that I did not agree with. And the Whitney Houston thing, it still bugs me to this day. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are a lot of other things. But that said, I felt there was an unfair, unfair, a level of unfairness directed at her style when a comparable peer who did a similar show Mm -hmm. was still seen as A-list. What do, you, what do you think should be next for her? Should she do it? I've been hearing about The View, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I Because I, I don't know what it is, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, she was on with T.J. Holmes. I commented only because she came out on with T.J. Holmes mm-hmm. and, and talked with him um, on Good Morning America. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I It, you know, I, I've only met her a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And I'm the last time I saw her, we were in Philadelphia, and she was at the train depot with some friends. I guess they were her team, some members of her team. And, you know, she was like, I look terrible right now. You know, don't look my... And she started telling me about the the, the thyroid and whatnot. And I, you know, I don't know. I, yeah. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. It really does. It, and, and I don't know her as well as you do. Um, but it does. And I, I'm... I don't know. I don't know. Now, I, you know, everybody knows you were close with Prince. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like his legacy is being represented correctly? Well, I think he had a choice um, to map out a better plan. And he chose not to map out a better plan. Mm. And he's a very, well, the smartest human being I've ever met. Second to Nick Cannon. Don't try to say, <laughs> say something bad about Nick Cannon. Um, he's brilliant and... Prince is second to Nick Cannon? No, I'm kidding. That's a headline. I said Nick Cannon was second to Prince. (laughs) Uh, No, uh, he thought out everything, every detail, and I cannot imagine that it did not once cross his mind 
that he did not have a plan for what happened. So I mm-hmm. guess I choose to assume that he didn't care what was going to happen. Wow. Or maybe sometimes you don't know the end is coming. You think you have time. That's all he talked about was the end. Really? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. Uh, the afterlife. Mm-hmm. What yeah. is that like? What? Better. Yeah, no, he, he talked about a lot that this is not the end game place, right? That there is uh, much more for us to know spiritually and to be connected to spiritually. I don't think he was as tied to these things as we believe. Mm-hmm. And that's why he left these things for others to deal with. Mm. I don't believe he was as tied to it as people thought. Mm. Now, with the show uh, Someone They Knew, mm-hmm. there was a personal incident that kind of made you gravitate towards this series as mm-hmm. well, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. my I mean, we, We've talked a little bit about it before. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. My sister was uh, murdered in an unsolved crime. And uh, the person of interest... Um, the only person of interest was someone in her life. And so that goes back to what we were talking about. Um, who amongst you could turn into somebody that you don't recognize? And so I don't. I was not there on the night that she um, lost her life, but I was very much aware over our years. My sister was extremely beautiful, um, so vibrant and fun. Like she knew how to play Uno. Um, and just like the really a life of the party kind of person. Mm-hmm. But um, she had in her past um, had some very um, violent uh, relationships and it wasn't just one. And so what I started to talk about more than the night that she lost her life was things that I was present to. And I was there um, when things happened um, to her that were horrifying. And it did make me wonder about safety as a woman right. and all of those things so yeah yeah what, what's, what's your experience been like you know hosting the Tamron Hall show what's been the biggest challenge oh <laughs> um standing standing up for yourself mm-hmm. you know I mean we all have shows that we had ideas that we wanted to do and then people start coming in the room and they try to change you or change how you handle the show or what um I think that I'm I'm, I'm happy that I have the show now in that um, my back was against the wall when I started it, so I, I, I navigate more strategically and more confidently. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is sometimes people don't agree with decisions that are made, mm-hmm. but I stand up for myself. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to shrink down, and I'm not going to... I went into rooms with people and fought for this show to be on TV, so I'm not going to lean out of that um, for anybody. But I'm always open to ideas, but the hardest part, really, other than a global pandemic has been just expectations, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Expectations of myself and what I have of my staff. And and when you talk about double standards, when you boss up in that way. Oh, my gosh. And you're you're all types of difficult. It's it's crazy. I I read things. It's an ongoing joke now with me and my team. I walk in, I go, am I as scary as they say I am? Mm -hmm. There you go. I I, I learned, to, by the second season, I just learned that it was a template, right? This is what they do. It's like, okay, uh, now the show is popular. She's out there. What are we going to say? Difficult, angry, yeah. this, that, toxic, work toxic yeah. blah, blah, blah. And and don't get me wrong. To someone working as hard as we do may be their definition of toxic. I, I don't know. So I would never tell someone how to feel. And if that's how you feel, I always listen to the staff. I'm there to have the conversation. But if you believe that we are going to give our audience a product that is beneath them, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we call our audience the TAM fam. Mm -hmm. I work every day to make sure that when a guest like you come, I said, Charlemagne's coming on. I don't want people just to think that he is a shock jock or whatever their perception. He has layers. He's a husband. He's a dad. That's why we brought you on, on the show that you were on Mm -hmm. because I sat in a room and said, he's not one dimensional. Mm -hmm. I don't want him on for two minutes to come on and talk about some headline that he said this about somebody and got into it with somebody. No, I want the audience to know him. Mm -hmm. You know, people still come up to me now and talk to me about that episode. Really? Because it was an episode about mental health. And people, I mean, random people in the airport, I saw you on Tamron Hall talking about mental health. Well, that's interesting because I actually had a, and I'll take you behind the scenes, I had a, not a clash, but I had to sit down a producer and say, this is what we're doing with him. Because it was important to show you as the multidimensional human being that you are, not, oh, this guy on the radio that I may or may not have heard of. You are 
internationally famous. This show is internationally known. But that said, everybody don't know you. So mm-hmm. you got to take them through the journey. And so for me, that was important. Now, that might have been a hard segment for that producer to do because it took more time. Mm-hmm. But it paid off. And they loved the segment. And Thank I was happy you, you loved the segment. And the audience resonated. So, you know, nothing... You don't get to um, do something easy and just expect there to be rewards. You got to oh, She's looking at her watch. I know. She got to go. No, no, no. Damn, that was not damn, Tamron. You could have just said you got to go. She's My like, husband's calling. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. She got to go. Okay. <laughs> the man who would have jumped in the ocean for <laughs> me. The man that would have jumped. Well, we don't I'm know not this. answering well, this. We don't gonna, know. You know how to swim now, so. <laughs> You don't know. Wow. You we think don't you, know. You would, like, you think it, we just don't know. Why don't we? You said me. something earlier. That April I would, Fools and we'll punk them. Like, what is that show? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll say, ah, and no, you said something earlier that made me think because you said uh, <laughs> it was something about love and fear. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, well, what if fear overpowers love? I think it's better to be feared. But I'm saying in that moment, you could love this Somebody person, but you're no, afraid. No, please. He was a lifeguard. Quit trying to make excuses. You don't even know I can't I'm believe like, you brought this back. I'm just back. saying. It's just like, oh. What? I need to hear both sides. That's you, all I'm You need to up. hear As both sides. an objective si- journalist, I need to hear. <laughs> As an opinion journalist, <laughs> you, what other side? What could he tell you? I was terrified yes. that jumping in as a trained lifeguard to save her, he didn't even have to go reach for me. Maybe just pedal around me and say, babe, it's going to be okay. You're, they're going to pull you out. What if he threw a rope? I agree. A rope? He should have jumped, no, jumped in. <laughs> Angela, His fiance could have swim. <laughs> go get your fiance. And Angela said, what if he throws a rope? <laughs> okay. Grab it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to wrap it around my waist. They're going to pull me in? No. Tamara, before you leave, I have one more question because we know you're looking at your watch. I'm not looking at my watch. My husband called. Um, so what do you do when somebody tells you there's a guest coming on and they don't want to talk about a certain topic? Right? I, do you... Oh, I think about that. Mm-hmm. I do. Because, for example... Some guests don't like talking about exes and they're in the current relationship. I agree with that. Mm-hmm. I would never have DJ Envy on about another relationship because he's not, his wife is there. Mm-hmm. I always tell people, like, they'll have a, we'll have a guest on and they'll say, let's ask about, you know, the man she dated three years ago that happened to be famous or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I said, but she's not with him now. Mm-hmm. Imagine going to a dinner party and I ask you in front of your new guy about the guy three times back right. that's rude yeah. and so i feel like um there's got to be some decency for me mm-hmm. right i and i don't want anybody to feel ambushed i mean we had andrew, andrew gillum, gillum. On. i mean that was a tough one and people were mad that i didn't say well are you gay and i'm like why did i need to ask that question yeah. that wasn't he told me what he wanted me to to know right and i can still do a thoughtful interview there are certain things that I'm happy we didn't talk about here mm-hmm. um, because it just I'm not afraid of any answer, but we know we live in a clickbait world. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you both are going to be on, guests on my show very soon. I could have my f- team dig up all kinds of. Well, once I read on the shade room and I saw this mm-hmm. and da, da, da. what purpose does that serve any of us? Mm-hmm. So for me, um, I want you to feel safe. I want you to feel that. Uh, there's grace in mistakes. That's why I said with Nick Cannon, being able to get back on air, he deserved that shot. Mm-hmm. I want to interview Kanye West. I don't agree with some of the incoming traffic that's coming his way. I think people deserve grace. I think they deserve space. But that said, when you have a high-profile individual, they should be re- prepared to answer tough questions. Yeah, I thought you gave Andrew a lot of grace. And I, and I liked how you handled that because it didn't feel exploitive. And that's what I don't want to do, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And even when people, and you guys do a great job, when when folks come in here and they're in the midst of a scandal, they should be prepared. Oprah says, you cannot tell me what to ask you. You are in charge of how you answer it. Right. And so I always come in knowing that people might ask me something that I'm not, like I, I don't fully talk about Prince mm-hmm. for a lot of reasons, but I don't. But I'm always prepared mm-hmm. right. um, for it. So they should be prepared. We're big kids. We're on right. a big stage. You got a big stage, and if you want to stand on that stage, you got to be ready for the questions. And so that's how I approach the show. Some people have been nasty about it, and I just decline their appearance. I just say, we can't. We can negotiate, and I'll, I, some people will say, oh, I can't talk about it for legal reasons. I know when they're not telling the truth about that. <laughs> and I'll say, okay, well, let, what about this? But if there's a hard no and it's of importance to the audience to know, then I would rather pass. And I have said, come back when you're ready to talk. Okay. 
Well, Tamron Hall, we appreciate Tamron you for Hall. joining us this yes. morning. Amazing Thank conversation. You. Thank you so uh, much. Good amazing. to see you. And congratulations on everything. Two Thank more you. seasons. The new show, Sunday Nights? Sunday Nights. Um, Court TV. Court TV. I'm super excited about that. The Tamron Hall show, the book. But again, thank you guys. This is my first time. I was a little bit nervous. Really? Why? Not scared. Nervous because none of you would jump in the water to save me. And I knew that when I came in this world. Well, I can't swim. <laughs> no. Well, I'm happy because now that the, you're both going to be can't on. I'll call 911 and be like, there's going to be an emergency. We're in the middle of she Mexico in the ocean. That's all I can gracious. do. Angela, I love you. You're going to be on my show soon. <laughs> DJ Envy, yes, Charlemagne, come back anytime. <laughs> thank you so much. And please do not start any static with me and Nick Cannon. I have nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. Whatever comes to this interview yeah. is what comes to this I interview. Mean, All I can do is ask the questions, Tamara. No, it's your so answer. <laughs> Give me my bag like LeBron James. I'm out of here. Tamara, it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.